Welcome back to another episode of the S2 Everything Self-Defense and Beyond series. I'm your host, Nick Faruqi. This is episode 005, and today's title is The Path to Failure. Today's episode is going to be pretty short and sweet. Let's get straight to the point, but I have to warn you, there's going to be a couple points in time where you might think that I'm picking on you, and you're probably correct. I probably am picking on you to a certain degree, but understand that I'm not doing it to be mean. I'm not trying to bully you. I'm not being facetious. I'm only doing this because I care. I have the great pleasure of owning and operating S2 Strategic Defense every single day. And every single day, I speak with people and I train with people who are trying to solve a problem. What's the problem? The problem is that they're behind the power curve when it comes to taking responsibility and developing functional skills in their own personal safety, right? And I've been doing this for a long time. I started teaching back in 2000. I opened my first academy in 2007. I've had a chance to travel literally all of the country and internationally, working with people, everything from women's self-defense groups all the way up to high-speed, low-drag law enforcement agencies and all points in between. And so I'm coming from a place of compassion. I care. And I certainly hope that, you know, this channel and certainly this series brings you guys different content, different perspectives, different ways to look at things, and hopefully inspire you guys to take responsibility of your own personal safety, okay? That's how I wanna provide value. So we're gonna start off by identifying five reasons why people don't train. And again, this comes from a 20 plus years of, of hearing it from people. And so let's go through these, let's talk about them real quick, and hopefully let's change that paradigm one person at a time. Reason number one, not in any chronological order, by the way, is time. Nick, there's never enough time. Nick, I'm so busy. I just don't have enough time. And I understand, look, people have things going on in their lives. They have families, they have homes, they have work, they have businesses, all kinds of things. But let's audit that time. And this is an exercise I like to do for myself every three to four months, mostly to make sure that I'm being as efficient as I possibly can be for my business purposes. But I think it's something that people should do for themselves for whatever venture they're considering or neglecting. The audit goes like this. For the next seven days, I want you to write down minute by minute all of your activities. Okay, From the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, every single minute should be accounted for. right? 6.01 to 6.03, I was in the bathroom. 6.04 to 6.28, I was driving in the car. 6.30, I got to, got to the office. Just every single minute, minute by minute for the next seven days. And when you do that, the first thing you're gonna realize is there's a whole bunch of patterns. Second thing you're gonna realize is that you have more time than you give yourself credit for. How much time are you spending on YouTube? How much time are you spending on Facebook? How much time are you spending on Instagram? How much time are you wasting on Netflix? How much time are you spending drinking beers with the buddies? How much time are you watching Lost on Saturday or Sunday or whatever it comes on, right? You're wasting a whole bunch of time. You have more time than you give yourself credit for. And to say that you want to put two to three hours a week off to the side for your own personal development will be nothing but you first have to do an honest assessment, an honest audit of your own time. So for the next seven days, write it down minute by minute, every single activity that you do. I don't care if you're in the bathroom, I don't care if you're on the phone, just audit every single moment that you possibly can. And then tell me that you don't have enough time. It's just that simple. Second reason is, I'm out of shape. I need to go to the gym before I go get involved with that. And to me, that's kind of like, God, I need to practice sleeping before I wake up. Okay, it just doesn't make any sense. Go to a good training program and you're gonna find out that your physical fitness is going to improve along with everything else. You know, there's a, I had the pleasure of training with a gentleman named Guru Rick Fay. Rick Fay owns Minnesota Collie Group based out of, of uh, Minnesota, globally known, very well respected in the martial arts industry. Uh, I'm not a, one of his regular students, although if there's an opportunity to go train with him under seminars, I will always do that. He's just that good, just a class act, right? An amazing guy, amazing instructor, great mentor. 
I was at a seminar and I remember him saying something. He said, Nick, you know what the difference is between going to the gym to work out and then a martial arts or self-defense kind of a workout? And I said, what's that? And he said, the martial arts and self-defense workout requires you to use your mind. Both of them require you to use your body. Okay? And that is 100% correct. Right? Look, I go to the gym as well. I go get my treadmill time on and you know, hit the weight pile and all that stuff. But I always make time in the martial arts side of things. So I get on the bag, you know, get together with some people, teach a class, but make sure I'm jumping on the mats uh, and doing my thing as well. As well as studying under more well-versed people than I am in different factions, right? So I have a firearms coach, I have jiu-jitsu coaches, I have striking coaches, I have edge weapons coaches. And so these people help mentor me as well. So I'm a perpetual student no matter what. And so when people say it's, you're out of shape, you can't go do a martial arts program, it's nonsense. Go join on a program and you're gonna realize that you're gonna burn probably five to 800 calories in an hour to 90 minute martial arts class as long as it's you know, a physical class, okay? Most people won't do that going to the gym. And the benefit is that alongside of learning something and using your mind and developing a functional skill, you'll also be developing good endurance, good cardio, good strength, good muscle toning. These things are all gonna be a part of the entire package. So don't say, I'm out of shape, I need to go to the gym before I do that. Do that and you're gonna realize that you're also getting in shape, okay? Number three is my favorite, okay? People say, oh, I used to train. And I say, oh, cool, how long ago? Oh, that must've been like 25 years ago. Really? This is a diminishing skill, okay? And so training 25 years ago and getting your green belt and hop keto is not gonna help you in real world violence today, okay? You have to get to a particular point, maintain that, revisit it, and look, everybody knows this, as we age, our bodies change. And as our bodies change, our tactics have to change, our attributes have to change. And so it's saying that, you know, I used to train, really what you're saying is that I'm too lazy to continue, or you're saying that I already know everything, and nobody knows everything, nobody, okay? There's always somebody that's better, and God, I got plenty of stories of that. Maybe I'll share a couple with you guys as we move along. That whole, I used to train, wrap it up, throw it out the window. That's a worthless statement, in my opinion. Number four, never ceases to amaze me. Number four is, I live in a good area. I never have to worry about that kind of stuff. And I kind of go, bad things don't happen in your area. Domestic violence doesn't happen in your area. Carjackings don't happen in your area. Uh, home break-ins don't happen in your area. People don't get assaulted in your area. There's no place on earth that crime will not go, okay? And criminals are getting hit to the game. You could break into a house in a impoverished area and get like nothing out of it, or you could break into the house of a upscale, well-to-do affluent area and get a lot out of it, and the risk is the same. If you get busted breaking into the house, getting a B&E, well, the punishment in court lawfully is gonna be 110% the same. So why break in and get nothing? It's better off to break into some place that, you know, has some stuff. Risk versus reward. The reward is much greater in more affluent areas. There's no place that's safe 100%, 100% of the time. You don't know what the next corner is gonna hold for you, okay? What the next moment has in store for you. You know, it's interesting because I uh, did some work with a very well-to-do private school when I was in Illinois, and the first six weeks, there were six gals who got sexually assaulted on campus, okay? The school never talked about it because doing that would scare booster money away from them. And so they never wanted to talk about it. So the students got together 
brought me out to start coming out and teaching seminars for them. And I asked them, I'm like, hey, isn't this a great area for you guys to be in? I mean, like the, the, the poorest house here is like a $2 million house. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, we're in this college campus and this is what's happened in the first six weeks. And this is week eight and that's why we brought you out here. So, you know, they responded really quickly or as quickly as they possibly could. No area is 100% safe. Quit saying that. It's silly, okay? And the number five is I can't afford it. And look, I never pick on people's financial situation. That's not for me to judge. What I can tell you is that go back to that same concept of auditing time, except now audit where you spend your money, okay? And if you spend you know, $200 every Friday night at the bar going out with your buddies, and then you tell me I don't have any money, I feel like that's a problem. If you go out to eat every single day and you're you know, in these uh, really nice restaurants, you know, $50 meals, $100 meals, that's a problem. And so it's not typically a I can't afford, it's a I haven't budgeted for, all right? It's not a priority where I wanna spend money at. And so if it's important to you, if this is something that you've prioritized, you'll make the budget for it. Aside from that, martial arts academies and self-defense training uh, facilities have significantly reduced in prices. And now, with the realm of online classes available to you and uh, you know, uh, virtual classrooms available to you with the use of technology, you can still be learning and training pretty much for dirt cheap. Nothing's for free, nothing good's always for free, let's just say. But the access is there, and it's super affordable. I know this because I have online classes that sell very well, and typically it's people who say the same thing. They say, I couldn't afford going to a class, or I didn't have time to go to a class, so this uh, virtual class, your online courses, at least give me a chance. I you know, I have a buddy of mine or a, one of my kids that I train with, and so we go through it and work on everything that you, and so they've taken the responsibility of doing what they can, okay? Even though affordability uh, in cash or in time may not be there for them. You have all these resources that are available to you at all points in time. And so these are the five main things that I hear all of the time. And again, I've traveled most of the country teaching seminars. I've owned, you know, multiple academies. Uh, I've worked with everyone from brand spanking new student, college student, women's self-defense programs, all the way up to some high-speed low drag law enforcement and all points in between, okay? And so I feel like I have a pretty good pool of information that I can kind of dive into and be like, hey, you know, what's common here? And so these are the most common five things that I hear. Time, I'm out of shape, I used to train, I live in a great area, and then number five is I can't afford it. So between all of that, I hear two things. Okay, you can give me any of those five excuses. What I hear is different than what you're saying. I'm hearing one of two things. Number one, I'm hearing that it's not a priority in my life. Got it. Nothing bad has ever happened to you. You know, I don't put a seatbelt on when I get in my car because I plan on getting into an accident. And I don't need to get into 100 accidents to inspire me then to put on a seatbelt. I do it as an insurance policy in case it happens. And I may go the rest of my life by never getting into an accident. But man, I am glad that I'm wearing that seatbelt and at least I've taken some precautions in the event that something like that ever happens. I'm best protected as best as I possibly can be, okay? And so if it's not a priority, I would highly recommend that you ask yourself why it's not a priority. Why is your safety not a priority? Why is your loved one's safety not a priority? Why isn't your spouse's safety not a priority? Why isn't, why isn't your kid's safety not a priority? Why? And what other priorities are taking its place, right? It's priority to go do all kinds of things, but your own safety, which goes everywhere with you, isn't a priority. So. Um, Think about that for a second. The second thing that I hear when people give me any of those five excuses, as an underlying statement, they could give me any of those five, but here's what I'm hearing. 
I don't like being uncomfortable. And I get it, learning anything new is uncomfortable at first. And this is a very physical kind of activity, whether you're doing martial arts or more self-defense based type of training or firearms training, anything athletic, right? It's a very physically demanding type of a task. And so at first, we feel uncoordinated, we feel out of place. If you have other students that are on the mats with you, they might be performing well because they've been there for longer. And it's just kind of awkward. And the reason why it's awkward is because it is just brand new. It won't take you long to be up to speed. I'll give you guys a quick example of this. Here's what I want you guys to do. Do it with me. I want you to take your fists and I want to put them in front of you like you're holding a steering wheel, right? Three o'clock and nine o'clock. I want you to put your left thumb up and your right forefinger out, okay? Now I want you to switch those and switch them back and switch those and switch them back. Now you guys don't know this, but content creators on YouTube with the new algorithm, we can actually see you guys as well. And I just watched about 20 people almost poke themselves in the eye. Why? It's because you haven't built that neurosynaptic process, the, the connections between brain and body, right? The body cannot go where the mind has not already been. You have to get out there, explore, discover, educate, familiarize and then try to gain some level of mastery over those things. That's how it becomes an actual functional skill. So it's not going to be done in a two hour seminar. Actually, you know, what's the rule of thumb here? How long does it take to develop a habit? People say about three weeks, right, on average. Well, why three weeks? It's actually not three weeks. It's not a duration of time. The real answer is about 63 to 65 repetitions, okay? On average, between repetitions, you'll get 63 to 65 over a course of about three weeks, depending on what the task is. And so that's how that three weeks time frame came about. But it's actually 63 to 65 to develop one skill. Once you get that skill, then you can add a different type of a progression to it or some kind of resistance. It could be faster, it could be against uh, some kind of resistance, something that stresses you maybe, and then now another 63 to 65. There's a reason why people say it's 10,000 repetitions to mastery. 10,000 repetitions of doing the same exact thing over and over and over again to mastery. It takes time, right? And we just prove that with our fingers. And so, you know, when people say that it's uncomfortable, I get it, all right? You wanna break that uncomfort, spend a little bit more time, get those reps in. You know, one of the things I used to teach my students when I had my last academy back in Chicagoland, I used to say that learning happens during the class. Training happens on your time, okay? Learning happens on my time, that's in class. Training happens on your time. So what are you learning from this class and then how are you practicing that before the next time you come back? And that's how you get comfortable with something and break the mold of feeling awkward. Okay. Here's kind of a fun story for you guys too, speaking of awkward. So, you know, I didn't start off training in jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu was a, a far stretch away from me for a while. I got involved with Kali and JKD, and those are my core arts, right? The JKD aspect of things brought me to learning some ground fighting. And so our instructor at the time, we had a group of about 15 or 20 people, said, hey, we're gonna start getting into ground fighting. And I'm like, I don't know anything about ground fighting, but I got a lifetime of striking arts, right? Punches, kicks, you know, uh, even some weapon side of things. I don't know, nothing about, I never wrestled. You know, like that's just not something I've ever done. It was awkward, it was super uncomfortable. Let me give you a little bit more detail about this particular story. My first training partner was a guy named Sean. Sean was a police officer, he was, a 6'2", six, 6'3", six, so he's like, like my height, maybe a little taller, and he was about 300 pounds of solid beef, okay? Big guy, I weighed in at a soaking wet 175 pounds at the time, and so we did our first ground experience. Sean got his bear claws on me, threw me to the floor, laid down on top of it. He didn't know a whole lot about grappling either, but being a police officer, he's learned a little bit of ground control tactics. So he had one leg up and he had some wrestling background, I believe. Got me on the ground, I'm underneath him. I'm in full panic mode. 
I can't tell you how many, how quickly I got back to my feet, right? 300 pound guys laying flat on top of me. I can't breathe, I'm sweating. I'm trying to catch my breath. My body's going cold. I think I'm gonna die. You know, I'm not claustrophobic, but I was claustrophobic at that moment. And it, it was just not a great experience, okay? And I realized that this is super uncomfortable to me. And my instructor at the time came over and said, you look like a fish out of water, Nick. I'm like, I feel like a fish out of water, man. And he's like, but you have to get comfortable with it, Nick, because what happens in a self-defense scenario, if you fall, if you get tripped, if you get thrown to the floor, if somebody ambushes you from behind and you're face down, you don't have any skills to navigate the floor. And I said, well, I appreciate you noticing my lack of skill on the ground. What am I supposed to do? And so that was something that I looked at right away and I said, this is something that's uncomfortable for me and that's the reason why I jumped in. That wasn't an excuse why I stayed out. That was the reason why I jumped in. And then subsequently later on in life, I started to enjoy the aspects of jujitsu to a certain degree. And so I got myself some jujitsu coaches and joined a jujitsu academy and started becoming a student of that. Not to say that, you know, I'm some great jujitsu expert, I am certainly not, but I have enough skill to navigate the floor and I'm not uncomfortable being down there, okay? So keep that in mind as well. Ultimately, all of these things are about one thing, preparation. Uh, what are you preparing for? Well, we're preparing for something that we hope that never happens, right? But what, what we know is that things happen, bad things happen and they're random, and typically we are behind the time curve on that, right? We're playing catch up. We're hoping to have enough physical, mental, and emotional fortitude to withstand the initial attack, be able to navigate our way through, and either get the heck out of Dodge, or be able to engage and come out, at the very least, as safely as we possibly can. And so if we're trying to prepare then that means that we're preparing for something that's hopefully beyond what we've thought about. We're taking responsibility of our own safety and we're willing to be uncomfortable. And this has now become a priority. Here's something that, uh, kind of a big story. Um, terrible times, okay, terrible times. So, but I'll share this with you guys here without mentioning any names. I think this is something that's really important and hopefully you think twice about what you're doing after this. So in the, you know, my entire life I've been on motorcycles. I used to ride motocross, then I got into street bikes and start racing street bikes and just really enjoyed the motorcycle life, right? The two-wheel life. And in the early 2000s, I was a part of a whole bunch of riding groups. And these groups would get together once a month and we'd go do like a charity ride, Toys for Tots, or you know, that kind of a thing. But it was just a good group of guys that all enjoyed motorcycles. We all got a chance to come together, hang out, admire each other's rides and all that kind of stuff. Well, I made a friend in that and the guy was almost twice my senior, okay? I was probably 21, 22, and he was probably in his upper 40s. Super nice guy, super cool guy. I had a GSX-R750 back in those days. He had a Hayabusa when the Hayabusas first came out. And just a great guy. Really enjoyed uh, hanging out with the guy. Well, he lived in the south suburbs of Chicago. If you guys are familiar with Chicago, there's a city kind of south of it called Burr Ridge. And uh, lived in Burr Ridge, nice area of town, good suburban life, you know, had a wife, had two kids, one of them was a teenage daughter, one of them was a, uh, you know, a boy, probably about 10 years old. And so his daughter went to a game at her high school. I don't know if it was a volleyball game or basketball game or whatever, either way she went to a game. And when she went to the game, she caught the attention of a couple dirt bags that saw her at the game. When she left and walked back home, they followed her. She made it home, made it inside the house. These two guys broke the door in, took the entire family hostage, tied them all up, duct taped them or tied them with whatever they tied them with. That's including my friend, the wife, and the son. 
and then they drug the daughter upstairs and took turns on sexually assaulting her over and over and then got away okay it took months for the police to be able to find these dirt bags months and about six months after the incident I remember sitting around there's probably about five or six of us guys that all got together went to go see him and I remember something that he said that really struck home everybody was giving their two cents on the matter right man what about this what do the comps do what about that you know could you have done this could you have done that and he just paused he stopped the entire conversation in one sentence he said I was absolutely helpless I've never prepared for anything like that and my kid had to pay the price I want you guys to think about that for a second he literally took the blame for what these dirtbags did, although he's at no fault of his own. He was at home in the safety of his own domain, hanging out with his family, not doing anything wrong. You know, his kid went to school to go be a part of the game, made it home. Everything was fine until it wasn't. And then when it went bad, it went so bad, and he takes blame for everything that transpired that afternoon, okay? I wasn't prepared and my kid had to pay the price for it. And that's exactly why it's so important for us to take the responsibility of our own safety. Look, if you can't protect yourself, you certainly can't protect anybody else. And what you'll realize is that the deeper you get into this thing, the deeper it pulls you. It's kind of a rabbit hole. And so, you know, you start to train and when you train, you start to realize the things that you don't know and now you try to find answers for that. So it's kind of a perpetual thing. And just because something didn't happen doesn't mean that it won't. And it certainly shouldn't mean that you should become complacent and just be like, well, I used to do that. I don't have enough time. Man, I got out of shape. I can't afford it anymore. Or hey, I live in a great area. My life's totally different. Get it? And so when people give me those excuses, Essentially, what they're doing is they're setting themselves up on the path to failure. All right, guys, so I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, sorry to leave you on such a downer with that story, but I certainly hope that these things help inspire you to take responsibility for your own safety, get involved with the training program. If you don't know about a good training program, feel free to reach out to me. I'll give you some online sources. I have a huge network if you want. I can reach out to see if there's somebody in your area. And if this is something that you would like to impress upon somebody else, by all means, share this video. It helps me out a lot, and hopefully it'll help them out as well in realizing a few things. Uh, make sure you guys like, comment down below. Let me know if you guys got anything out of this. It really goes a long ways. And hit the notifications bell. YouTube's algorithm, aside from letting me see you guys, uh, has gotten really picky about these types of subjects. And the only way for me to make this channel grow and these conversations grow is with your help. All right, guys, be safe, be well, and I'll see you guys on the next video.